cities are growing, which means we keep on building. But know what else rises with those glossy flats? Emissions. We all need space to live, but building buildings is terrible for the planet. The construction industry accounts for almost 40% of global CO2 emissions. That makes the pace of urbanization pretty alarming. So what can we do? And what is green architecture anyway? Just because you see some sustainability gimmicks, maybe you see wood, maybe you see a green facade, that doesn't make a project sustainable. We have to understand that sustainability is locally inspired. Every city brings to it um, its own particular set of conditions. We went to Germany's most energy efficient house to see what it's like to live in a place that actually generates more energy than it consumes. Spoiler alert, it gets kind of competitive. Every week or so, and we were like, oh yes, we're above the average. And we also toured a project in Berlin that uses completely upcycled materials. But the real solution might involve a total reconception of what we think architecture is, and for whom. First off, let's look at the scope of the problem. And that starts with some really depressing facts. Emissions from the residential and commercial building industry hit its highest level ever before the pandemic. Construction alone has a huge carbon footprint, from manufacturing materials like concrete and steel, to the transport of those materials, and the on-site electricity used when you build. All of this is called embodied carbon, and is responsible for about 11% of global emissions. And then, of course, we need to heat and cool our flats and get rid of all our waste. Believe it or not, this operational carbon accounts for nearly a third of global emissions. The maybe inconvenient truth is uh, there's not e one easy fix uh, for all the buildings. This is Dr. Christine Lemaitre. She's the head of the German Green Building Council, and she spends most of her time reminding developers about this. There's a cultural and climate context where buildings are happening and that the building has to react locally to, to the surroundings. When we heard that one of the world's biggest Energy Plus apartment buildings was in Germany, well, what did you think we did? We've come to the most energy efficient of them all, the Aktivstadthaus in Frankfurt. This building actually generates more energy than it consumes, hence Energy Plus. And like proper reporters, we just barged into someone's house. Uh. Hi. Hello. This is David and his daughter Lola and that's Juliana and one-year-old Miro. They live in a pretty nice, pretty normal-looking flat with a disco ball in the city center. But under this normal veneer, there's a robot lurking amongst them. And this is the, well, the, the energy center of the house, so to speak. Every flat comes with this iPad that shows you how much energy the building is producing from its solar panels and when. It also shows how much energy you're using and how that stacks up against your so-called budget. This were warm water too, and there we're a bit over budget because the kids take baths. Do you like taking baths? Yeah. <laughs> no, but what the weirdest thing about this whole thing is, is the ranking. So the whole 74 units of the house are rated concerning their energy and warm water use. Where's the page where you can see what all your neighbors are up to? Yeah, I think you can't. <laughs> Which is good, I think. You know, I think this whole thing is a bit uh, weird. It gives this sort of a competitive feeling while it's actually, it shouldn't be. But don't humans need competition for change to happen? Anyway, the main question is, does the iPad work? And when we first moved into the apartment, I did check it every day or every week or so, and we were like, oh yes, we're above the average or something, and now... It gives you kind of motivation to, yeah. to change your habits. At the end of the day, we're still in Frankfurt, where the average salary is almost 60,000 euros a year. Living green is an expensive privilege here. And just because the building is green doesn't mean all its residents are. Normal people live here. I mean, there's the, the Mercedes G-Class parking in the parking lot downstairs. Most people here just live normal Frankfurt lives. I don't know any um, uh, Fridays for Future activists living here or something like that. We had to cut our visit short, because guess what? We got to meet the person behind the iPad. Frank Yinker is the chairman of Frankfurt City Housing Management. And he lives in the basement. Just kidding, he's showing us how this whole thing works. Das Gebäude ist konzipiert wie ein Passivhaus, das heißt luftdichte Hülle und eben dann das, was an Energie verbraucht wird, regenerativ. 
What I didn't know was that it also comes from sewage. Sie wissen, in jeder Stadt gibt es riesengroße Abwasserkanäle äh, und fließt das äh, Schmutzwasser in die Kläranlage und hat eine Temperatur von zwischen 16 und 18 Grad. Und über diese Tauscherplatten wird eben Energie dem Abwasser entzogen, dann über diese Wärmepumpe, das ist dieses monströse äh, Gerät, was hier steht, dann eben auch dem Wärmeerzeugungskreislauf eben von diesem Gebäude zugeführt. So, was the iPad his idea? Haben Sie einen in Ihrer Wohnung? Nein. Nein. Willen Sie einen? Ich will es machen. The Aktiv Stadthaus may be a success story, but it's built with all new materials, including lots of concrete. With so much of our cities already occupied by buildings, maybe the question we should be asking is, do we really need to build all that space? This question led us to the circular house in Berlin. It's a co-working and residential space that takes a totally different approach to green architecture. In professional speak, this is called the circular economy concept. So what does that mean? When we say we build circular, um, there are two main aspects. This is Simon Lee. He's the head of the Circular House project. One is built from waste, yeah, from secondary resources, basically. And let's build in a way that after the life cycle of a building, you can actually remove everything um, and reuse it or throw it on the compost. For starters, the structure itself used to be the loading hall of an old brewery. Everything has embedded value in it. This is Dr. Nirmal Kishnani, a professor at the National University of Singapore and an expert in sustainable architecture. That concrete, to build that, took a lot of carbon. And so you begin by recognizing the building itself as a kind of, uh, as an asset. We got a peek at the construction site of the residential floor, which will have eight flats that share a large common area and kitchen. So here you see we built 100% with wood. Nothing is nailed, nothing is glued, it's all screwed, so you can remove it like Lego. It's really 100% organic, so this is really just clay, and behind the clay is just straw. We have just put in a lot of dense straw and wood, and that's it. They also used wood wool for insulation, compressed straw, upcycled plywood, hempcrete, a natural alternative to concrete made of hemp shives and lime, and recycled plastic bottle doors. Downstairs in the co-working area, Simon and his colleague Sasha showed me perhaps the world's most unknowingly famous meeting booths. We rescued actually material from a Yoko Ono exhibition in Leipzig. It was actually assembled as coffins. We disassembled them and just like built these meeting booths out of that. All very cool, but how many of us have access to the people running Yoko Ono shows? Sourcing upcycled materials is not only hard, we simply don't have enough people doing it. Take it from an architect. You need a whole industry to support that. It has to be done at scale. It's about building an ecosystem around this idea. I don't think it's just a um, simple gesture of uh, putting a piece of something from the old building into the new building. So is it always better to repurpose an old structure than to build a new one? If you look at it from the CO2 perspective, yes. And why isn't there more of that happening? Because it's challenging. It is, it, is, it is more difficult. You need to put in the extra work to basically analyze the building. What can I do with it? What kind of resources does the structural system have? You know, is it even able to repurpose? For many, they feel if we just build new, we have everything under control and we don't have all these unknowns and we don't have any uncalculated risks. But good architecture is also about access. If greener buildings are just there for the 1%, then it fails as a social project. 40% of the living space in Circular House would be devoted to social housing, and most of its residents will be queer women of color. But these are just some of Germany's approaches to making architecture greener. Its focus is energy conservation through technology, which, of course, isn't the solution for everyone. One fits all in the building industry is absolutely the wrong strategy, and a strategy we've followed through so many years and now we have to deal with all the consequences. By 2025, two-thirds of the world's megacities will be in Asia, where the pace of urbanization and need for housing is incomparable to that of Germany. Buildings after 30, 40 years are being torn down and being replaced because, you know, the quality was not good or they're not modern anymore. 
But whether it's Europe or Asia, building better will be a challenge everywhere because capital will always be impatient, as the architect Rahul Marotra said. Investors want fast returns, but a building has many other stakeholders. We have very different definitions of what a good building is. How do you negotiate these mindsets? How do you align people towards a common goal? I think this is one of the biggest challenges that we face in industry today. Could you live in a house that tracks your energy use? Not sure I would, but tell us below in the comments anyway. And make sure to subscribe. See you next time.